Yeah, g'day. Welcome everyone to the Tripod Live with Clarkie and Winnie. We're with you for the next half an hour to recap everything we just saw in round 14 of the NRL season. And of course, we've got to talk a little bit of origin. Winnie, Titans second half woes continue. Teddy bounces back. Raiders somehow get home. All that and more. Uh, before we do, let me welcome him as our co-host. How you going, mate? Good, thanks, mate. And the biggest headline of uh, round 14 just occurred in the game we've just finished watching. And that's Nathan Cleary. Probably, almost certainly out for Origin mm-hmm. 2, out for who knows about Origin 3. You know, it's, we'll find out the severity of that uh, hamstring strain or tear suffered very early in the Panthers. Narrow victory over the Dragons, a bit closer than expected. Cleary being out had a lot to do with it. And I feel like we can't start the show any other way, but uh, reacting to that because it has kind of uh, shook up the rugby league world and I put it out there to our followers as well. Um who do you guys think should be the halves pairing? Because what a set of dominoes this sets off now because I feel like you've got options at seven, then that might influence your option at six, then does that influence options at 13, nine, anywhere else on the park? Where are you going with this, Clarky? My first thought goes to, I'd love to see if you were an else knows, has the line moved already? Are people already yes. anticipating? So, so three and a half, Queensland was favoured. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it is minus four and a half or five and a half. So it's moved mm. through the key of four in a couple of uh, locations that I've seen, which I expected. You you have to downgrade New South Wales, Cleary to whoever they pick next. You certainly do. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, because you go back to the 2020 series, I believe it was, or, or maybe it was 2021. I can't remember the exact series, sorry, but he played really poor in round uh, in game one, that series. And the way he bounced back in game two, I'll tell you what, he was MVP. It might have even been last year, come to think of it. Well, he was. He Perth. was man of the match last year. Uh, he also missed game three in 2021. And if you recall, New South Wales towed Queensland up in game one and two. And yep. then Queensland actually won game three. On that occasion, Mitch Moses got the seven jersey. But I know mm. you're probably going to ask me, but I'm going to ask you first. Who would your Blues halves be at this point as as it stands? Yeah, it was Mitch Moses and Jack White in that year. I'm going to rule out Mitch Moses this year. He's playing great footy. Uh, my first option is going to be Nico Hines, having won that Dally M medal and not really getting a proper opportunity in game one. I'm going to move him straight into that seven jersey. That opens up the 14, most likely for Matt Burton, I would say. And I'm going to keep Jerome Luai. I'm going to keep Jerome Luai just based on the fact I don't think it sends the right message to that Blues team that, hey, we were in game one, we could have won if they go and make wholesale changes to that lineup. And particularly because it's at Suncorp Stadium. If it was at a core stadium down in Sydney, I'd be more open to changes. But I just think Suncorp Stadium, where you've got a record of 3-16 and 16 and you're looking to go on the other side of history, would be the wrong time to be making big changes to this side. Uh, one popular one I'm seeing online is bringing in Cody Walker and Adam Reynolds. You a fan of that or not particularly? I think that could actually be the best option, at least for New South Wales attack. I mean, the game is at Suncorp Stadium, which is Adam Reynolds' new home now. Reynolds Mm. just won the head-to-head against Nico Hines in Cronulla, to be fair, as an underdog. Like, for what it's worth, Reynolds probably going as good as any halfback in the competition. And then you bring in Walker. And, of course, you know, Latrell Mitchell should be available Cam Murray, is he suddenly a 13? But then he did have a groin strain Saturday night. So pending that, uh, you've got Campbell Graham, you've got Keon Kalamata. Like, how far do you go? Did you suddenly make it a South centric team? That would not be the craziest option. Did I mention Damian Cook as well mm. would suddenly come into calculations? Uh, the cast combination that you mentioned there, Clarkie, I think is the least friction. So you just slot Hines in, which is what New South Wales halves would have been if, like, Cleary had been injured you know, in game one at any stage. Hines into se- uh, into seven, Luai stays at six, and then Burton, who was 18th man, would be your 14. That I put a poll up in the tripod group. That's actually the fourth most popular option, uh, Hines to seven, Luai to six. So ahead of that, third most popular is Reynolds Walker. So just going back to that old South Sydney connection, second most popular is the one, I think, I've been racking my brain, um, give me more time, but if I had to pick it, I will go Hines at seven, Burton at six, because I think I'm going to give Hines that opportunity. I think you can't go any other way. As you said, he was already in the squad. He did win the Dally M. He's had a couple of poor performances. I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I would give the opportunity to Nico. And then at that point, I'm thinking, who's the best 5'8 available to me? Because 
Luai doesn't walk into it because there's not that same connection, continuity, and I have to go in the direction of Burton. Although I definitely gave strong consideration to Cody Walker. I think Burton just stronger defensively and, of course, um, you know, the kicking options that he gives them, the, the kicking left and right. So that would be my favourite choice, uh, which had, um, as I look now, that's had 17% of the votes, but nearly 50% of the votes in the tripod group said Nico Hines at seven, Cody Walker at six. Yeah, not the worst option there, but um, yeah, the Adam Reynolds one as well. I mean, a wise man once said, I think he said it about a few days ago, that uh, Adam Reynolds could lead a reserve grade side to beat an NRL side. <laughs> I believe that was uh, Mr. Winnie Senior there. Don't mind Cook to 14. I think people are forgetting what Jerome Luai was able to do with that Samoa side at the World Cup and maybe not respecting that as much. And, you know, it's it's origin. It, it, there's no setting up for the future. Every game is must win. That's for certain. But it, it's also a thing where if you try to outthink the room a little bit too much and go for these extraordinary picks, dare I say, to Vita Pengai Jr. At, at starting prop, then when it goes wrong, you open yourself to a floodgates of criticism. And if Freddie gets this wrong it's almost certainly his job that he loses. So my gut feeling says he will err on the side of caution. Um, Cameron Murray, let's say he's out with that groin injury. Your replacement for him, I'm going Keon Kolomatangi. Well, yeah, Murray was off the bench, so you could replace him with a host of uh, forwards. I think Koloa Matangi is definitely going to be uh, in the Blues team. I'm just thinking now, would I go Koloa Matangi left starting second row and Liam Martin right starting second row. I would still stick with Hudson Young, who got hooked in uh, game one. And uh, you'd stick with Frizzell as well, whether or not mm. um, whether or not he starts. I like it, but I'm going to keep Liam Martin on that left side just for how we saw him hit that nice straight ball of Luai. But and then, then again, it might got... not be all Penrith players on the left. That's the thing, because you, it exactly might now right. be, might all be South's players on the left, because it might be Latrell left center. It might be Cody Walker. It might be Adam Reynolds for all we know. Um, so on. then you may actually play Liam Martin on his more familiar right side. And may, maybe Stephen Crichton is your right center as well, uh, because Tom Trebojevic is not going to get a game in before Origin 2. So I feel like we could speculate all day about the Blues side, but specifically the halves. Uh, I want to read some of the comments that are shooting through because I think uh, it's it's polarizing. We've got Nico and Cody Walker. Richard said Nico time. Now we've got Barney here saying that uh, Chin, as he uh, affectionately refers to Nathan Cleary as, out for Origin 2 is huge. It should lo- move the line four points in the Blues' favor without that player hamstringing the Blues attack. Not a big fan of uh, Nathan Cleary as Barney. So that's a bit, bit of a bold statement. Wayne says Hines and Burton. Uh, Slit Sin says Hines and Cody. Colin, Matt Burton should be there. John, I've copped a caning this weekend, despite the fact he's got a Broncos display picture. Reynolds and Cody Walker from Sin. Nico Hines, Cogger and Luai. So you just... That's from Seebs. Just keep the Penrith connection going. Adam Reynolds has to be in contention. Adam Reynolds, because of his experience, he does feel like the kind of player you plug and play for one game. It's like a one-off. You've got to win in a hostile environment. You could trust him to throw him in there, whereas Nico is like your future, more likely to get more Blues caps in the next five years than Reynolds. But when it's for all the marbles... Um, you know, every option is on the table. So it is fascinating. Uh, it, uh, again, if people are asking me, Hines and uh, and Burton, but it is that close. Um, anything else on this topic, Clarky? Otherwise, I should actually um, summarise how we did from a punting perspective this round. Mate, it's super close. One person that I didn't really hear mentioned by anyone, there's Mitchell Moses. People are forgetting him and Freddie are very, very close. And when Cleary was out, he went to Moses, presumably because he was going to be the next backup half. So... Don't discount him. I'm going to throw no, two good call. Queens. And his team made the grand final last yeah. year too. So he's in you can't really say he's like to out of form. That's for sure. Mm. I'm going to throw two Queensland names at you before we go. Jai Arrow looks unlikely, as does Tom Gilbert. Any replacements jumping out for them? So we said probably Horsberg can get in the team. And as for Jai Arrow, he's playing off the bench kind of his ability to cover the middle and an edge um, is pretty handy. I'm trying to think, I mean, Jeremiah Nanai was pretty good today. Could like he Cape could well. potentially come in? Hop yeah, Capewell again in a winning team yesterday. Um, and some there's another Queenslander that uh, I had as a mm. possible replacement for Gilbert because I think Calfusi, yeah, Calfusi will still be suspended. One more game to go. Yep. Um, 
yes, our name eludes me right now. But um, we've done about 10 minutes of Origin. I just felt like we had to shoehorn that in. Uh, from a punting perspective, pretty good results. It could have been better, but three best bets won two of them. Won the mixed matchup as well. You'll always take that. I feel like I had four other plays that I was kind of close to, and in the end, three of them would have lost. So I'm kind of glad which which plays I took and which ones I left. The biggest um, gripe I've got from the weekend is probably just the same game, multi, yet another close call because I like the Warriors. I actually shifted it to Saturday and did a Warriors-centric same gamer. And we had the Warriors winning by more than 10 points, which I had in the multi. We had uh, Dolphins to not score three tries in the first half, but I went CNK for a try. I tell you, he could not have come much closer, um, but he missed out there. So, you know, it counts for nothing ultimately because that's another L in the column for uh, same game multis. Really unfortunate. And then that's the way the cookie crumbles, right? Ultimately, in the end, it doesn't matter whether you all legs lose or one loses, but it's always more unfortunate when it, or it feels more unfortunate, I should say, when it's the one leg and that one player being CNK played so awesome like he did. Um, and I really considered him for my take on Toppy try score as well. So that would have added some double hurt for us. Um, in that department. But let's jump into the Friday night game. Of course, no Thursday game. That was the women's state of origin where, let me remind you all, the Maroons' dominance continues. Uh, but it was the Raiders v. Tigers. The Raiders got up 20 to 19. My MVP, I went Jamal Fogarty in this one, had the two tries, a very good kicking game. I get, my first initial takeaway is we thought the line looked suspicious. We thought it looked too good to be true. Um, and up until the 70th minute mark, I was thinking, well, like we've just we've just missed an obvious play here. Like it, it wasn't too good to be true. We've overthought this, but then all of a sudden the Tigers go bang, 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 and they did that in another game this year that they were losing. Um, and yeah, it reminded me a bit of was it the Bulldogs game? It was, just, yeah. They looked like they're going to get pumped twenty plus. Of course, we had a best bet in that game as well. Bulldogs laying the points, and then they did that was even more extreme. That was three, four tries in three minutes. This mm. was. Probably four tries in about, what, eight minutes? Um, you're right. I was thinking the same thing. And, of course, we had Bulldogs for a best bet that day as well, just to add to the yep. pain of that one. But I suppose for Tigers fans, it's a real silver lining to their attack that, or to their season, sorry, that their attack is so awesome in these short bursts. And, you know, once they polish around the edges here and they become a more mature football side, you, you know, you could see the Tigers in a finals game a few years from now down against it, and all of a sudden they can explode and, and, you know, do this sort of thing, which is really, really fun to watch when they're in that sort of mood. And, you know, you go to the Bulldogs game, this game, and then the Cowboys game where they broke all sorts of records. Um, and from the Raiders, my final takeaway is probably their focus wasn't quite there in the last 10 minutes. Uh, my assumption is they're looking forward to next week at that stage, which is, of course, Jared Croker's 300th NRL game, which I've got my tickets to, and I'm really excited for that one. How did you see this game? And we shouldn't forget Luke Brooks uh, in the mix for Origin yeah. as a bolter, perhaps showing the Blues how to execute when you have a man advantage. Because that was the turning point here where yeah. Starling was sin bin for repeat infringements. But, gee, this was a crazy game to kick off the round. There's so many different ways to look at it. So originally, as we said, why is this line only one and a half? Who's taking the Tigers? Raiders seem the obvious pick. I really like the Raiders. I'm aware that the Tigers off a buy at home are not easy beats, but the Raiders should be superior. And I was in a similar boat to you of like, I should have stuck to my guns there and played it at 18 nil. However, when it was 18 nil to the Raiders, I didn't feel they deserved that lead. Like I did feel like the Tigers had blown opportunities and you got to look a bit closer. All three Raiders tries are deflected kicks. All three of them, two along the ground that Fogarty leaps on both and a bomb that, you know, is not just uh, diffused by the Tigers, bounces a couple of times, ends up in Rappiner's hands. So it was a bit of a phony 18-point lead, but then the brutal part of it is the Tigers are on the back of a man advantage. As we say, a blitzer tries. Not only do they level the scores at 18 all, but Brooks with the clutch field goal puts them 19-18 in front. At that point, they should win the game, uh, but unable to catch a short kickoff it seems to happen so many times in these in these games I think of the Knights kicking a field goal to get in front against Penrith but then couldn't gather a short kickoff ultimately gave the opportunity right back the Raiders uh, took it well in fact Fogarty misses the kick and the controversy there is that uh, Isaiah Papali'i is trying to charge down the kick and ultimately you know contacts and, and I would say cleans up Fogarty 
And I know it's really harsh. I feel like most of the neutrals watching the game just want the Tigers to win that. So the way you're looking at it, it just feels so cruel to lose the game. But I think it's the right call. I think you can't um, go through the legs of a of a kicker, whether it's in play or a field goal shot. So it's the right call. It's a penalty to the Raiders and they win by one. So the minus one and a half would have lost. Yeah, I think it is a total coincidence that we said it was fishy and then it ended up that. You know, again, I'm not like a, I'm not an ultra um, conspiracy theorist or, you know, saying these games have a script. If I was an ultimate conspiracy theorist, I would have just bet the Tigers with the plus one and a half at the true fishy line. But I am at least skeptical enough to have said, hold on, I don't know why this line is what it is. And I left it alone, as I explained on Wednesday. End up being the right decision. I'll throw my two cents in, even though we're going to go quick this uh, tonight. My two cents in, I was totally fine with them resting um, Jared Croker which means that he's going to be available. Or, yeah, obviously he's going to uh, play his 300th at the game you're going to, and it's going to be an amazing atmosphere in Canberra. I know some people critique the decision. I think the point that was lost in it that I never heard anyone make was, Croker's not one of the Raiders' best players. He's fringe in the team. Like, they didn't even pick Xavier Savage. So they've actually got plenty of outside backs to choose from, and Croker's getting on. It's not going to hurt him at all to sit out for a game so the people like the the journos that go on 360 that like to just pick a story and, and criticize the club and say, oh, what if they don't make the finals? They're kind of missing the point that that like the team isn't worse without Croker uh, because they've got that backline depth. Yeah, I think people made a little bit too much of the fact when they went on that win streak that it kind of coincided with Croker's return. Yes. I've got no doubt it helped. Like I, I'm not going to say that he doesn't deserve to be there. He's still a great experienced player, but I completely echo your thoughts. You said, I think the referee decision was correct. I'll go one further and just outright say, although people, it's unpopular, it's the right decision. You just, you can't make contact. It's as simple as that. Um, it casts me back to the James Graham uh, Bulldog situation against Adam Reynolds and the Bunnies on Good Friday in like 2015. And they brought Gerard Sutton on the footy show and he explained it. As a referee, this is what the rule book says. This is why I blew the penalty. This is why the goal conversion was in front. And the fans were just relentlessly booing him. Uh, final takeaway for me, when he closed for the Tigers, but ultimately seven straight losses in a row at Campbelltown Stadium. Um, not the sort of record you want at home. Warriors v Dolphins opened up our Super Saturday. The Warriors walked away with a win, 32-8. My MVP was Sean Johnson winning, and I'm not going to say it was a vintage performance. I've said that a few times this year. It's a 2023 performance, and I'm going to put my hand up here and say that in part, I did a 20-part series of bold calls for 2023. One of those bold calls was that Sean Johnson will finish this year in reserve grade. And from there, naturally, I saw his retirement. Um, I made that call on the back of Metcalf, Tometi Martin, Dylan Walker, and Volkman all being available. But although those are four talented names, none of them are even close to Sean Johnson right now. He walks in at, into that team all over them. So a really, really bad prediction there by me. Uh, but the Dolphins are now 0-5 outside of Queensland which is kind of how we saw their season unfolding early in the year. It wasn't how we saw it in the preseason, but after we'd seen a few games, we started to say on the show that, look, there's big occasions for them. They're going to win these big milestones games, uh, but once they start to get to the grind of a full season, potentially they dip away. I think we're seeing it now with that 0-5 stat there. Um, and, of course, this was our um, better same game, also, which we touched on earlier. We missed out by one leg, which was unfortunate. Uh, but just looking at this purely from a footy perspective, the Warriors are a fun side to watch when they're on, aren't they? They are, and they rebounded, and they did what I expected them to a week ago against the baby Broncos. They pretty much did it here, and I think you made that great point there that Wayne Bennett is excellent at kind of circling dates on the calendar and getting his team up for those occasions. But this side, and we've said it before, they don't have that depth or that level of talent that they can necessarily bring it every single week, and it's why I've never, even on the highest of occasions, I've never said... I think the Dolphins will make the eight. It's awesome that they're kind of in the mix. Um, but the inability to probably win games like this consistently might keep the Finns out. Whereas the Warriors, if they would have lost this one on the back of a very disappointing loss, which you can chalk up to just not taking opportunities against Brisbane, there would have been some serious soul searching because the Warriors are close to full strength in this one, uh, had control pretty much from the outset and, uh, and, you know, comfortable winners. Yeah, again, I already mentioned that CNK, if you watched it, you would have been shocked to see how how he managed to not score on, on a couple of different opportunities there. 
uh, seems to always be the way. But um, nevertheless, at least we did catch the best bet. And of course, the mixed matchup was Warriors, Rabbitohs, and Sharks to outscore their opponents combined by more than 20. So when we got a 22-point win by the Warriors, we were already ahead with South Sydney and Cronulla to play. Yeah, that was awesome. And while you were talking there, I had a look for the Dolphins signings just to end it on a positive note. Uh, Josh Kerr, I think he's in great form this year. Herbie Farnworth coming into this round actually led the NRL in post-contact meters. I covered the sport for nine years now. I've never seen that before. That is bloody awesome. And, of mm. course, Thomas Flegler, who's now a origin, or was an origin rep, but now um, solidifying himself further. So um, tough loss for the Dolphins fans. But to end on a positive note, the future is uh, is bright for your boys there, Winnie, I think. One team that uh, the future isn't as bright as I wish, to be honest, and I'm just waiting for you to change this graphic now. I'm not sure if you noticed this when I sent it to you. I noticed I it, I, and, I, and I thought, like, my eyes are playing tricks on me, <laughs> but I have just cottoned on to the joke. Yeah. I'm sure um, some of our followers are sharper than me, and uh, we'll already get it. But you better explain it for the people that are listening to this right now. Yes, for people that are listening, uh, the Titans logo is missing its second half. Only the first half of the logo is appearing, which of course was reminiscent of our loss to the Rabbitohs where they won 46 to 28. My MVP was Cody Walker, who definitely put himself in frame for that origin position again. Just had his hand in everything. Stats only shown one try, one try assist, but um, for a lot of those uh, uh, try assists that were given to others, Cody Walker undoubtedly set it up. Um, the obvious reaction here from me is we faded in the second half again. Um, and it's so hard to be positive. So I just said that I'm still behind my team. I think South's are premiership favourites. The fact we were able to compete with them for any period of time does please me. Uh, but if you're a Bunnies fan, I mean, you're just thinking, we lost our captain Murray. We lost Jai Arrow. We didn't have Luttrell. Uh, we're missing Tom Burgess. And, you know, this score could have looked a hell of a lot uglier. So I'm kind of at the point now where I'll, I'll, I'm going to lower my expectations for the Titans to how they were a few years ago, where I'm just happy if we compete and there's some good moments and signs of improvement. Um, I, I thought coming into this year, it's really sad to say, but I, I thought coming into this year um, with some of our signings, particularly Kieran Foran and Sam Barrels, we had the side to make the finals again, but it's becoming more and more obvious. We probably don't just yet. Um, but yeah, my takeaway from this one is um, Cody Walker. I mean, stats-wise, he is the form player of this competition, particularly around attacking stats. Um, I think he, he was your Blues player, wasn't he, for the 5 jersey? No, I'm still Burton? actually going Matty Burton because defence, Burton, right. I think, um, does get Burton across. But if it was just purely on attack and I need to score a try, I'm going Reynolds Walker. I, I can't mm. go past that. And I can't ignore Walker's form. He got into the arena. And probably just unfortunate timing because when was the last time we saw Cody Walker? Was it 2020 mm. when they lost yeah. that, you know, the, the unlosable series? And, um, you know, some players it's hard to kind of shake that um, or get rid of that foul taste. But Cody Walker has continued to be one of the um, most consistent and electric, you know, halves in the whole competition. Souths was the best bet in this one, minus seven and a half. It looked like a team on a mission. So many players that were really out to prove a point. You know, and Ilias, not one of them, but I do think Ilias is um is improving week in, week out. But Walker, Campbell Graham came back. Um, obviously, Murray backing up off that, that loss, although he was injured. So that should have given your Titans a chance. Um, who else am I kind of missing? But Jai uh, went well, down as well. Yeah, I mean, Kaloa Matangi, he's only been back a couple games. And I feel like no one ever puts Johnston in the, in the fold. But nonetheless, uh, this Rabbitoh side just met business. And despite a slow start and the fact that the Titans got out 12-0 and I was thinking, oh, hold your horses here. Um, I thought the mixed matchup was basically a certainty. And then your Titans are up 12-0. Very quickly, once the Rabbitohs got a bit of possession, it was 12-all. Then the Titans got on top again. At one stage, your Titans led 22-16 to before 30 unanswered Rabbitohs points. And by the time the Rabbitohs scored 30 unanswered, Murray was probably off with that groin strain. You mentioned a Jai Arrow. I forgot. What was Jai Arrow's injury? It was ankle, knee. Syndesmosis, um, which is typically okay, three to six ankle. weeks if confirmed. Yes, yes, twisted in the tackle. Um, so I explained why the Rabbitohs won this game. I will say Tino started off the bench, but I think he got on when it was 12 all. Dave Fafita not on till the second half. But I throw it back to you, like, because your team had not played at home in seven weeks. 
They were off the bye. The Rabbitohs were still missing some key players. So it's kind of sad for you to say, oh, as long as we just compete. And I get that the Rabbitohs are the premiership favourites, but no team in the competition should concede 30 straight at home when you're, you know, leading in the game. Have you got any answers of like kind of what's gone wrong or anything else more you want to say about your team? There's really no excuses. Like even if I came up with the best reason in the world because we've done it so many times that there, I can't really, um, I, I really just Because that would ca- classify as another double-digit uh, loss. Wasn't that the yeah. stat you were telling me that, that yeah. the Titans have the most in the NRL era? Despite yep. being, you know, the second newest team. Yeah, but that's, I mean, let's exclude the Dolphins. They couldn't have it yet. If you just mm. look at teams, <laughs> yeah. We've, there's, uh, what, if, if NRL started in 1998, that's uh, 20 years. Other teams, um, if my maths is right. 25. Yeah. It's, and you've it's been long. in the comp about 15. Yeah. It's, yep. so there's, te- yeah, 10 years there, sorry, that, you know, others could have made up the, the stat and ahead of us. So it's disappointing. My only takeaway here um, to wrap this all up is around Campbell Graham because he did say in his Fox League uh, post-match interview that his sternum injury is something he'll have to deal with for the rest of this year. And although he's in great form, that didn't sit too well with me because he's such an important player and you don't want your best players injured coming into the finals. You want to hit it um, full steam ahead. And so I wonder, post the origin period, will Jason Demetrio, this is a really, really bold take, by the way, will he be tempted to rest Campbell Graham Move Latrell Mitchell to centre for his load management and keep Blake Tuff at fullback. I'm not saying they should go that way, but it's an option. You like it, rate it, hate it, or think it's a bit silly? Well, Graham's right centre, Mitchell's a left centre. Uh, that would You wouldn't play Latrell Mitchell on the right, so you'd be yeah. slotting Isaiah Tass potentially over to right centre. It's funny. If it's like pain management, not necessarily something you can um, you know, make worse, then I think players are dealing with it. I think a lot of players are dealing with injuries that we're not even aware of sometimes. Yeah. Oh, no doubt, man. No doubt in my mind that uh, footy players are injured every single game. Um, It is such a brutal sport. And it's, you know, it's not the fact that you play one tough game. It's the fact you play 27 or not 27, but it it extends for 27 weeks of, of almost continuous training, a lot of wear and tear on the body. Super Saturday closed with the Sharks v Broncos. We're in Points Bet Stadium, uh, where the Broncos' record was not good at all. Uh, but they ended up winning 20 to 12. My MVP was Staggs. Uh, I think that was a great game by him, and it kind of reminded everyone that he is an origin caliber center. Probably not as consistent as he would like this year, but he has had a few really, really great performances like that. Um, dare I say, this was the strangest, quote unquote, close game of football I've ever seen because. That score is it did not fit how I saw this game. Maybe I saw it wrong, but I saw a side in the Sharks that were always within reaching distance, but never good enough. And a Broncos side that was extremely dominant, but they never put the game to bed. And so you ended up with like um, thinking like, oh, this one's over. No, Sharks are still there for the full 80, really. I spoke in our preview show of the Broncos stat struggle. They hadn't beat a top four side in Sydney since 2018. Um, but what's that I did miss? And you know me, I'm a bit of a stats man. I'm disappointed I missed this one. Sharks are now zero and five against top eight sides this year. They have not beat a top eight side. And that was posted by Fox League uh, Sporting News, sorry, today. And they're the only team in the competition with that record, which is mm. concerning because Sharkies are in, uh, I believe they're a top four time side right now. The fact they've not beat one of the finals contender makes me think that. You know, maybe I'm overhyping them a little bit too much with how high I am on them. Um, is it a favorable draw? Time will tell. I think the latter itself right now, when you're so hard to get a gauge on, because you've got sides that haven't had a buy, um, sides that still have two buys to come, etc. So it's a bit of a mess at the moment. But yeah, that Sharky stat, was that one you were tracking or did that take you by surprise there? It takes you a little bit by surprise because you are waiting for like, what are their signature wins? But for me, one of their signature wins was when they beat the Roosters. And I thought, we remember we what did that as a yeah, live watch along, you know, and I thought the Roosters would win that game. But, of course, the Roosters aren't as good as we all thought. So now that win isn't as impressive and that doesn't even classify as beating, you know, a top eight side, although it still yeah. was a, a pretty legit win. I, I believe on that occasion the Sharks were in off a bye and I think the same again this game. The Sharks were off a bye. And you just said before about, you know, how tough the players are, how grueling the competition is. You go back to the Tigers who came in off a bye. One of the reasons why maybe they had a bit of petrol left in the tank late against the Raiders. Tim Sheen said, 
multiple players were playing with uh, you know pain killing needles throughout the year, but none of them had to off the buy, so it allowed them to freshen up. And that's one of the several reasons why I liked Cronulla in this one at home, despite the fact that I believe Brisbane are the better team. You know, you had these, um, well, I would say four Origin players because we knew Cobo wouldn't play, but four Origin players may or may not back up. So when you go against that team, you would like to think maybe one or two because you just never know if there there is, um, you know, any injury doubt or just um, precautionary um, to, to rest players, especially after Brisbane faded out last year. And I think you made that point on Wednesday that, um, you know, that Kevy's got to be wary and um, they've started the season so strong, but everything has to be centred around not repeating the end of our last season. So there's a fair chance, you know, one or two might not play for Brisbane. They all back up. Fine. I took the Sharks minus one and a half in the first half. Line closes five and a half. So, so the line was two and a half on game day. And what happens when you only have a first-half bet? Well, you better hope that there's not a 10-point breeze against you. And, of course, that's the way it crumbled uh, with the, you know, the coin toss shakes out that way. So then we've got minus one and a half into what uh, I think it was Mick Ennis called a 10-point breeze. In any case, Cronulla's up 6-4 and attacking the Broncos' line, butchered a couple of chances to extend that lead to eight have Brisbane, I think, like third tackle inside their own 10, and Brisbane swings it from right to left and throws a quadruple cutout because they knew Katoa was struggling a bit on the wing for the Sharks. Katoa tries to go in and jam. The ball just bounces, but into the arms of Corey Oates. I couldn't help but notice how slow Nico Hines yeah. was retreating to chase Oates. Oh. Not saying he's meant to run down a winger, but Oates is not that fast, and Oates got slowed down by another Cronulla chase and then had to put in a kick, which then ricocheted, which then bounced a few times and was then picked up by Mam. And if Hines was, you know, dare I say about as fast as me, I, I reckon I would have been in the picture. I, I feel like I had the same thought on Wednesday night that Hines is slower than I imagined he'd be. Whether he's carrying something, I don't know. I'm really bitter because, of course, that's a 90-metre try to nowhere and suddenly we're not winning our, our best bet. Ultimately, we don't deserve to win it because Brisbane, ultra impressive. And the biggest takeaway that I can give you in this game, you said Brisbane dominated. I don't feel like they did in terms of territory or in terms of um, meters. They dominated in terms of being a brick wall in front of their try line, though. Some of the best events I've ever seen. Um, this was a really high-quality game, high-intensity, like really enjoyable. I also – I still thought Cronulla was going to win with like half an hour, 20 to go when they were down eight points. I just thought they're going to break through. They're going to get one and then maybe a couple more tries. Um, Cause they just had all the running and at Brisbane looked to me to be a side that was clinging on, but that's what made it so impressive that in fact, it was Brisbane that got a late try and extended the lead. And even though Cronulla then scored after that, uh, it was nearly all said and done by that point, but Cronulla had no answers. They could not break. Brisbane's defensive ranks, and that's ultra impressive. They've burned me two weeks in a row now, and I just, you know, tip my hat to them because the way I see those games, I really felt like the home side that was a lot fresher was going to get the better of Brisbane. Obviously, I'm talking about the Warriors last week and Cronulla this week. It wasn't the case. Brisbane, a team that, uh, you know, I sniffed out from the beginning of the year talking about how good they are. Um, They've exceeded even my expectations. They've really impressed me definitely, you know, contender, as we've said, for the last few weeks. Yeah, the last two weeks, I'm putting Broncos in the elite category. That's up there with the Panthers, Rabbitohs, etc. Really impressed with them. Uh, well, this goes to show how slow Nico Hines must be. When you said, uh, I couldn't help but notice, I said, yeah. And I I could have swore you were about to say how slow Corey Oates is these days. Mm, <laughs> then when well, you said yes. Nico Hines, that sums no, it up. it was. It was like, it was um, watching a couple of them on the treadmill. And, and if, mm. if he could have got closer... You know, probably don't give up that try. I I should say Brisbane actually scores off a bomb on the final play of the first half. So I still believe that moment cost the win because, you know, if Brisbane doesn't go all the way down the field, score there, it changes the momentum. But I don't want to get into all of that and say what if and all that. I, I, I cop the loss in that game regardless. Just just hurts a little bit the way um, it did happen because I, I – Felt like we were going to win it with like five to go in the half. 
It did feel that way, as I was saying. It was sort of a game where it was never fully in bed, but it was at the same time. Another winger who'll be disappointed was Mulatalo. Finished the game with five errors, and um, like they weren't easy tries, but like at least four of those were getting smashed over the right. sideline or knocking on yep. a potential and one, try. I'm pretty sure one of them uh, was at the point when Cronulla was up 6-4 in the first half, and if they would have scored again, we nearly um, we nearly make it a Saturday sweep. Mm. And, and you're right, they were coming off the bye. They had a round 13 by the Sharkies. Doesn't get any easier. They're uh, next Sunday, the final game of the round against the uh, Storm in Melbourne, where Storm will be desperate to bounce back. And on the Broncos draw, as you said, um, talking about a fadeaway last year, yeah, round 19, they win against the Eels. They then lose to the Tigers, Roosters. They beat the Knights, and they head into the last three rounds. Now, they only need to win one of these games, keep in mind. They lose in Brisbane, 12-60. to 60 to Storm. They then lose 6-53 to 53 to the Yields, and then they go to Nostrata Jubilee and versus the struggling Dragons. They must win at this point. Cobo sits out the game saying he's fatigued, and the Dragons win 22-12 to 12 in a game that didn't matter much to them. So um, yeah, you're right there. There's but been a lot of... Conversely, this year, the Brisbane are yet to have a bye. They've got one more game before their bye, which is Newcastle, which is pretty winnable. And have still got three buys to come this year. So when you're looking at a team like Cronulla on the ladder, four of their points are by virtue of a buy. None of Brisbane's are, and they're going to get three more breaks uh, later in the year, where some teams have only got one buy left. So it is all set up extremely positively. We see that you know injuries um, can really shake up the competition, as we saw with Penrith today. But it is so far so good for Brisbane, and they're showing the DNA of a true contender in the sense that they don't even have to be on point with their attack. Um, They're defending in a way that is going to give them a chance to beat anyone in the whole NRL. Yeah, spot on. And I can see that comment from Dan there. It makes perfect sense. I completely agree. They're great this year. But I do think we still have to acknowledge last year because they were good last year as well. Not as good as this year. And they've answered a lot of questions this year, but they still haven't answered the question, how do you finish the year? Which, of course, they can't just yet. We'll all have to... Um, wait and see, but certainly great signs for the Broncos and really a great period to have your buys as well during that origin period for them. Roosters v Doggies opened up an unexpected Super Sunday. Uh, the Roosters walked away with a 25 to 24 point win here. My MVP was Teddy. I tipped him for a try. I was super happy when he scored a try. And uh, it's it's another game though, realistically, where the Roosters win, but it's not convincing. And there was a game a few weeks ago that they just lost. Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. The, the Dragons game. With, yeah, they lost on the buzzer. And, and I said, look, even if they won, I'm not impressed by that. The, uh, the Roosters that I tipped to win the Premiership this year aren't beating the Doggies by a field goal. They're winning by like 60, um, if I'm being absolutely honest. That is the the sort of strike they have across the park. And they, there are some injuries. There are some excuses. But ultimately, you, you're not beating the Doggies by one point if you're a Premiership contender at, at this stage of the year. Um, but yeah, even though I'm a Queenslander, I was happy for Teddy. Just back to the Roosters one more time. Teddy's not going to play like that every week. We've seen that this year. And most importantly, the other side's most important player, in this case it was Reid Marnie, isn't going to fail a HIA every week. So they have to be better. Um, Don't have too many other takeaways from this one, Winnie, besides it was nice to see Teddy bounce back and um, maybe maybe silence a few of the critics, if you will. Uh, How'd you see this one? And and I was one of them. I kind of had a bet each way. I understand on Wednesday... I said I would pick Edwards. I think at this point his form is um, is too strong and Teddy's is not good enough and that that's the strongest option. But then I also said, but, you know, be wary ruling out a champion. So I was kind of going to look right either way if Teddy didn't play well here or he did and, and he had a double and I was thinking of you, um, you know, calling that. And I felt exactly the same way that this was like the Dragons game where if the Roosters would win, as I was thinking during the game, it would not be impressive. And, man, the Bulldogs could have won this game. 24-all, it's there, you know, it's there to be won. And you've got Matty Burton, so you're a threat to kick a field goal from anywhere. And they couldn't execute. And, in fact, Burton had a really poor pass. I think it was to Perham at a very inopportune moment that, um, like, early in a tackle count in attack that resulted in a drop ball. And then it was the Roosters that ultimately got in uh, in the zone and who kicked the field goal must have been Luke Keary. Uh, Luke Keary, who else? And uh, the Roosters, you know, hang on here. 
some exciting tries in this game, some length of the field tries, a couple down the left side through none other than the Fox, of course, by the Bulldogs. Um, but, yeah, I was watching this game thinking how are they kind of uh, hanging in in here, the Bulldogs, once Marnie was out with the HIA. Uh, but you just, you know, I'm watching the Roosters closely. I'm going, Joey Manu doesn't seem like the same player that he used to be. Obviously, it's kind of makeshift halves. You don't have Brandon Smith. You don't have Victor Radley. And the Roosters just didn't seem like we just talked about how impressive Brisbane were defensively. The Roosters don't have any of that. Like that's what their that's what you know their foundations used to be built on was staunch defense, and then they can execute an attack when they need to. And I do remember that game. Remember the Roosters held New Zealand scoreless in Auckland, and it was the first team that was held scoreless this season. I thought that was the Roosters kind of turning a page, turning the corner and getting back to that kind of fundamentals. But since then, they've also had games where they've leaked tries, and this was another one like that. And you're right, they get the win. It's so, so much needed off a bye, but so unimpressive as well. So, I mean, you take your two points where you can get them, right? At the end of the day, that's all that matters um, when we get to the end of the competition or regular season, of course. Your man, uh, Dylan Edwards, probably not his best effort today. 19 runs for 196 metres, still impressive there. Uh, four tackle breaks, his only other attacking stats. Uh, yeah, for the Doggies, maybe it was an experience, maybe it was losing Marnie, but, you know, they jumped it to that 12-0 lead. Um, and the other thing I, I really wanted to touch on was the Roosters' defence that you referenced. When they won back-to-back, there was a stat that it was the Sharks in uh, week one of 2018. They scored 12 points against them. From that point onwards, no side ever scored 12 or more against the Roosters in any finals game. So it was absolutely their defense that were winning them those premierships. It was a brick wall and impossible to get through. And a side that's usually a brick wall, and I certainly thought they would be, was the Melbourne Storm, which is our next game here. The Cowboys uh, end up defeating the Melbourne Storm 45-20. to I went with Drinkwater for my MVP, but it was kind of pick a backline member. They were all fantastic in their own way. Um, Valentine Holmes probably as well. You have to got to give a shout out to, but I mean, this was just a horrible call by me. Um, if you guys remember my play for this one, it was the storm to shut down the Cowboys and, um, hold them to 12 or less than 12 in this game. And I mean, I was only off by 33 points. Uh, but I will say it's the first time in nine years, the Melbourne storm have conceded 40 plus. So, you know, it, it wasn't really a bold call by me. It was just one of those things that just happened. But I will say, for the Storm, it's not the first game this year they haven't shown up. You could argue the Titans game, the Manly game, and now this one. And that was always a trademark of the Melbourne Storm. Didn't matter who they played. If they were played a bottom side, they'd put you to the sword. Let's not forget, Cowboys were 16th coming into this game. Um, so they had to win. It's as simple as that. They had to win, and they did. And I, I look at this Melbourne Storm side, and I start to think, look at those other games, and I think... Do they have the same issue that the Eels had last year where against the best teams, they're going to show up and, and they're going to get the win 70 80% of the time. But against the lower-ranked sides, they just slack off and take it a little bit too easy. And we saw from the Eels last year, and I think we can see from the Storm this year, come finals time, they're still very capable. And once you're in the top four, you give yourself as good a chance as anyone, which I think the Storm will do. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a problem for them potentially. Not a great problem. For the Cowboys, absolutely brilliant. If I'm going to be, if I'm going to be a devil's advocate, though, Winnie, I'm still not 100% convinced on them this year, just because they have had a great game like this before and then completely slacked off, um, like they did against the Tigers, for example, the following week. How'd you see this one? Did you have any inkling a score like this was coming? No, I mean, this was the lean that I was close to playing the Cowboys. So I want to make it clear because I didn't actually say last game I would have played Roosters. People will recall. I would have made Roosters the best bet if I could have got a line nine and a half, but the line was yeah. 10 and a half, so I didn't play it. And in the end, they win by one. So lucky I couldn't find that. You know, that's a lean I got wrong. Uh, in this case, my lean was to the Cowboys. And remember, I just said I stayed off it because the Cowboys are yet to have a buy and the Storm have had two buys. So I feel like that is poignant yet again. You're talking about some dud performances by the Storm, but you didn't mention again uh, getting beat 20 plus in Magic Round against the Rabbitohs off a bye. And look, every team has a dud performance here or there, but it's not very excusable to have 45 put on you when once again you are off the bye and you're coming in fresh. Like, you you know, the travel doesn't hamper your preparation. You've got, you know, 
plenty of time to be fully prepared for this game. So now that's two 20 plus losses off the buy. So what are the Storm getting up to in their bye weeks? Are they, you know, sneaking off to Bali or mm. I don't know um, what, what Bellamy's done. And I thought they would have got the recipe right for the second buy after the disappointment last time. Every time Melbourne lose, you can't help but think of the forward experience that they've lost from a year ago and start to think they're not the same side. And every time they lose, I always think, geez, how far away is Pappenhausen? And if mm. he comes back, is he the same player? And these are questions that was really hard to answer. But then every now and then Melbourne um, gets to another level and you just think, oh, they've still got Grant, Hughes, Munster, and they've still got players that, you know, play above their, uh, you know, necessarily their skill or ability because they're wearing a purple jersey. So it's not like I can write Melbourne off. I will say if you are someone that's on the 11 to 1 tripod season multi, you know, an afternoon like today keeps that alive. That multi involves, you know, the Roosters making the eight. It's certainly still possible. If they would have lost today and made it four losses in a row, you nearly would have put a red pen through them. That multi involves the Cowboys making the eight. A statement like today, and let's flip it to North Queensland. Boy, what a win. They were ultra impressive. One of the things we've said this season, they haven't seemed to be able to find points when they needed to, and the attack has looked so stunted. The attack looks so good today, so free-flowing, and they're key, like, they're key players. You know, Drinky just having a day out and Valentine Holmes, the special things he did, does. Nana is back. Um, Jason Tamalolo hasn't even returned to this side yet. So there is a lot to be positive about for the Cowboys. And the season multi also needs the Storm to miss the top four. And that feels like that was actually the longest odds leg of the whole multi. And that feels like it was probably a good call as well. Yeah, I went. I remember I went the opposite way to you in that one. I said Storm top four. We've got Jason Tamalolo returning next round. Apparently, he was very close this week, and really no excuses for the Storm. The only really key out they have at the moment is Ryan Pappenhausen. Um, the only excuse I can make for them is maybe the buy wasn't as influential as it is for other sides because two of their most important players, Munster and Grant, weren't truly able to experience the buy, but. Really, I'm not sure. But the Cowboys had players excuse. backing up as well. Just exactly as many, right. You know. So tough, tough go for the Storm. Really tough go. But I, I mean, the, the game next round against the Sharks will be a great, a great test because both sides need to bounce back, and they're both great sides. Closing out the round here was the Panthers and Dragons. We just saw it. Then Panthers won this one, 26 to 18. My MVP was Isaiah Yo. By nature of the fact he played 80 in Origin and 80 again in the middle, 100 plus meters, 40 tackles, just a classic Yo performance. Not how I expected this game to go, though. I was really confident on a Panthers 13 plus, um, and in a Panthers annihilation, really, is what I thought. And if I was the Panthers coming in, I'll be honest, I would have rested all of the Origin players, and I still would have taken them 13 plus. Their reserve grade side played hours before and won 30 to 10. There's some great players in that side as well. Um, but I guess the only thing I can think is the Origin factor wasn't as big as it was in previous years. Last year when they lost game one, I remember that they came back and I can't remember who they played exactly, but they just destroyed Newcastle. them. The Knights, they destroyed the Knights. They were angry. Not a big factor because obviously Nathan Cleary goes down and that is going to be the huge talking point from this. My tinfoil hat did make it out at one stage when I saw some rain in the first half because we know how the Panthers have played recently in the rain, although a very, very micro factor. But I just think for the Dragons, it was another game where it was close. But it's, it's not good enough. It's beyond excuses now. You know, if this had happened once or twice this year, you go, oh, but uh, Ben Hunt was backing up and, oh, we lost Jack DeBellin and um, Jack Bird was unavailable. But they've just lost so many close games now that there's no longer silver linings. You have to win a sum of these games. They just aren't. And so I still, I think they're still 17th on the ladder, which unfortunately for Dragons fans, my preseason prediction was the wooden spoon. Um, and because that was because I saw Anthony Griffin not seeing out the season and not other, not enough experience in the building there for Ryan Carr to get his side home. Uh, but yeah, I think you had this one 13 plus as well. So probably not the way you saw it either, was it? No, exactly. And I remember I gave a bonus tip. So I'm sorry if you guys did get on that, but I found a dollar seventy nine for the Panthers to win 13 plus. So, you know, and I say, look, where do you draw the line? That's a great yeah. bet. Um, I didn't play it as a best bet. And it's another one where I was wrong. So I'm lucky, but it's a funny one because that line closes 18 and a half. You know, you, wow. you, you, 
you will take 13 plus every day of the week, like as an extremely, as we call, you know, positive expected value bet, meaning that long term playing bets like that, you're going to end up in profit. Um, so you would have to be happy having that in your pocket today. It just unfortunately doesn't win, which again is why I said a few of the games I leaned and didn't quite get to a best bet. I was fortunate um, to leave those alone because they didn't win. Who knows how it would have turned out if Cleary doesn't have the hamstring injury early in the game. Obviously, that changed things as well as St. George just getting out in front and getting that belief because the Panthers players did all back up. And I wanted to make a point about that. And this, I didn't know either what was going to happen on Wednesday. So I was speculating who's going to back up, who's not, because I always think you've got to be careful with these players. If they've got a bit of doubt, it isn't worth it. It's one game in 24 and you know they've got like an origin series still ahead of them. And ultimately, everyone's season or for all the big gun teams, their season's defined by how they go in the finals. So I thought there'd be one or two players uh, withdrawn late who would where the club just decided not to back them up. But I actually think the theme of the round was for basically every origin player who wasn't injured, it was like a badge of honor to back up to prove something for their teammates. Like Abby Corusau, he didn't have to. The coach gave him the call and they put him on earlier than they planned. And then they said, do you want to come off? And he told him, don't take me off and stayed on the game. You know, that was pretty impressive after 80 on Wednesday to do that on Friday. Um, you know, Brisbane, all their players, apart from injured Cobbo, all playing big minutes. And you talk about the same, what was required for Penrith. I don't think that's necessarily going to be a trend that carries on once these players have got two, maybe three origin games under their belt. I think we will see players rested, but because there's only been one origin so far um, and there have been some buy rounds, the coaches aren't necessarily thinking that these guys are overloaded at this point yet. So Penrith was pretty full strength. I'm going to share another insight. I basically never give out try scorer tips as a best bet because I very rarely see a player that I think will score in excess of 60% of the time. And if I do see that, it's often like an Alex Johnston type player who's paying like $1.50. But this is a one exception where when I was looking at the game, I'm going, geez, minus 15 and a half is a bit steep, but like Toto is going to score. And I found Toto $1.75. So again, not quite good enough value for a best bet. I've mentioned uh, you could go Toto to score like in a same game on Wednesday. So of course he scores the first and I think Penrith's second try as well. Um, but, you know, another factor that you've brought up, Clarky, for the struggling teams, and I'll put Dragons in the same kind of bin, dare I say it, as your Titans, is conceding on the on the hooter mm-hmm. in the first half and how that just bleeds into the second half. And that maybe cost the Dragons the game because they actually would have had a four-point lead. It was, it was either four or six, probably four-point lead, um, and had the ball with like a minute to go in the first half, drop it, Penrith gets a scrum with 40 seconds to go and it's a kick, an early kick to Toto. Perfect from Cogger, who had a great game stepping in for, for Cleary. Uh, that finds Toto. It's a try that levels the score at halftime. And then you're going in the second half and the Dragons could feel they're in this game and there's no Nathan Cleary and it's a great opportunity for an amazing upset. But once again, the dragons are going to be dragons finding ways, new ways to lose these games. You know, Tyrell Sloan scores a miraculous try. It's 24 all and it's anyone's game. No, but one of his forwards stood in the line Amazing. and uh, obstructed. So it's not a try. And and I really don't like to be cruel and um or make assertions about someone's character or intelligence. I will just go as far to say that Sloan stopping dead still after Fiungai only knocked the ball backwards about three meters when he couldn't pick it up and Sloan giving himself up was moronic to be kind. That play maybe costs Dragons the game as well. So if people don't recall or didn't see it, it's it's uh, at this point, it's 12 all. It's 12 all and it's fifth tackle. And Jake Coggan nearly drops the ball, but double clutches, catches it, punches a kick into the corner. Fiungo makes an absolute meal of it, but he's sprinting back towards his try line. So when he taps the ball, it goes like three meters backwards and then he falls over. Sloan ends up with the ball 
and stops dead still. The ref says to him, it went backwards, it went backwards. Then he just goes, oh, I might keep playing then. Uh, and then burns three Penrith players and actually is streaking away, might score. And then the touchy, because he saw Sloan give himself up, decides to then tip the ref off that it was a knock-on when it was the furthest thing from a knock-on. So it's a horrible decision. It's horrible play by Sloan. And I just knew, of course, Penrith will score on the back of this, which they did. However, it wasn't the end of the game. Zach Lomax actually skied for a contested bomb to make it 18 all and the Dragons still had a chance, but in typical fashion, not being able to win a close game. And Penrith, I will give them credit, I think what won them this game ultimately, their forward physicality, it did feel like. And ultimately the winning try to Spencer Lenu is because Isaiah Yo is just busting his nose through the tackles um, and able to offload for a pretty simple try. Whereas when the Dragons make a half line break, like Sloan did later in the uh, late in the game, Penrith's absolutely desperate, scrambling and making miraculous tackles on the try line to uh, keep the Dragons out. So it just felt like the Dragons had to work so much harder to get an opportunity where Penrith just came on the back of uh, of playing hard, running harder and playing stronger. And maybe I didn't give uh, Zayo enough credit at the start that, yeah, he did tip on that try assist too. Um, it was Liotta, not, not Lanou there, Liotta to um, crash over and score. Um, on the, the players resting and not resting, for me, I, I, I think the coaches just need to show a bit of conviction at leadership and just make the call on their behalf. There's nothing cowardice about a player, you know, resting out for the full season. But it, it, for me, it's then on the coach to make that point at the press conference that I made the decision, the medical staff made the decision, he wanted to play um, just for the, you know, the sake of the play. Then on Tyrell Sloan, I'll be a bit more critical because I remember on a recap show earlier this year, I said he's got some really low IQ plays in his arsenal. That was when he threw a forward pass um, and it allowed the other team back into the game. I can't remember who it was against. Um, you sure it wasn't Magic Round where he tried to do a little grubber for himself on his own goal line on the final play of the first half? Yeah, My point that was is it. really. Yeah, I remember the yeah, half-time like, part of it. There's that many. There's that many of them. Um, the reason why I thought that, though, was he threw the pass at halftime, which was then knocked on by Billy Burns, which allowed the Panthers to score on the brink of it, which you just can't do. Um, but that's really all I've got for that game. I'm just looking at the Lions quickly from this round. The only teams I can see that covered it was the Warriors and the Bunnies. In terms um, of Raiders, favorites? Yeah, Raiders were half a point off. Roosters were nowhere near 10 and a half. Sharkies were favorites. They didn't win. Uh, Panthers opened at 15 and a half and Storm were favorites as well. So uh, two out of Good seven. Point. Only two out of seven favorites round. covered. Luckily, they were two. They were both best bets. Um, yeah. So I played three awesome, favorites actually. this round. So I've actually, at least I did, you know, two out of three aren't bad, as they say, in terms of finding, um, you know, a couple of games that did win very easily because mm. this game looked pretty straightforward. Uh, and I didn't think this round, I should say, and, yeah, I didn't know if we were going to get many close games uh, in today's footy, but, um, in fact, we got surprisingly close, and the one that wasn't close was uh, the massive upset by North Queensland. Yeah, and I, I wanted to point that out to our viewers because when only two favourites are, are winning at the line and we're on them this round, it's, it's a great result with, with so many um, upsets there. So it was a really, really great pick by yourself. That's all we've got time for tonight. But, of course, we will be back on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. where we will preview everything round 15, hand out some best bets, chat with you guys as we go. Um, so from myself, thank you very much for joining us for our recap show, and we hope to see you there again. Thank you very much.